Welcome everybody. We've got a live event, the first of many, hopefully, scheduled with Professor Steve Keen. Uh, this is a continuation of the uh, COVID and climate correlations channel. And we want to welcome everybody. You're noticing that there's going to be some participants uh, in uh, today's uh, event. Uh, and that is for patrons and special guests that are invited on the live event. So um, we think that this new interactive approach is, is, is going to yield some interesting conversations. And, uh, you know, we couldn't be more thrilled to have, have Steve leading the discussion. Thanks, Steve. How's it going today, Steve? Oh, <laughs> I've got to say a bad start. I, I'm a terrible sleeper and I woke up at 1.30 this morning and that was it. So if eyes are looking drowsy, that's the reason why. I got back to bed a couple of times, maybe got an extra 60 minutes sleep. So that's not so good. But I've already spoken to a newspaper about syndicating my ideas. Uh, uh -huh. they, they approached me and I've got a YouTube approach from, what's it called, um, Brilliant, the website Brilliant. So it seems to be, maybe I'm getting some access these days, but I'll have to wait and find out. Right on, right on. Mm. So we had a loose, uh, uh, intent or desire to jump into the Minsky software um, mm. and in particular I was I was thinking about um, oh let's see where was it here uh, in the new economics I think it was uh, figure 2.5 does that ring a bell Steve well I need to get the book and take a look and find out 2.5 oh. okay hang on <laughs> new section the fundamental monetary operations of the government. Yeah, I'm actually just explaining that of all things to the guy from the newspaper who's approached me to write a regular column. So, uh, yeah, I'm nice. all, all geared up and ready to go. Okay, so, yeah, just uh, feel free to share your screen and we can okay. jump right into right. it. Okay. I did explain Let's... to Liam and uh, that, you know, the... Uh, you know, don't don't feel that we can't, uh, you know, throw questions, even tangential questions into the, into the mix. Uh, it's, a, it's a small group here. So, mm -hmm. yep. by all means, go ahead. Yeah, okay. How long, what, 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 how long are we going to be together, just roughly, so I know uh, when to become assertive? <laughs> one, hour. one hour. It's... One hour. Yep. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, that's what I, what I got today was a bloke who wants me to write Please. an economic column for a newspaper. I won't talk about it until it actually happens. Not a, not a large amount of money, by the way, just as an interesting audience to be able to reach. But he sort of started regurgitating the um, um, uh, reserves, banks lend out reserves argument to me. So what I did was so I can prove that why that's wrong in 10 minutes, which is what I did. So here's Minsky. Minsky's main, it's a system dynamics tool. So you can use all these elements up here to create mathematical models that give you, uh, you know, dynamic systems and so on. But there's plenty of programs that will do that. What The only thing that Minsky has, which is totally unique, is this idea of what we call godly tables uh, after um, Wynne Godley. And what they let you do is model financial dynamics using both at the front end, double entry bookkeeping. So I'll just show this in, in double entry bookkeeping mode. Uh, and at the back end, generate differential equations out of them, which shows what's actually going on. So this is a looking at the banking sector. And I'll bring up the its own individual table. I've got more flexible powers to control it here. And I want to start with saying, you're looking at a bank. Uh, we all know that banks have reserves. So the, we're going to have reserves as an asset for the banking sector. And banks make loans. Those loans is an asset of the banking sector. <clears throat> they take in deposits from the public, uh, and then the bank itself has its own equity. And I'm going to ignore long-term equity and just look here at short-term equity. So this is the, like the operational account of the banking sector. And let's say we start with 100, let's say it's 100 billion, it could be 100 trillion, it doesn't matter, it's just a, a number to show an example. 100 billion, let's say, in reserves, say 500 billion in loans, let's say there's 550 billion in deposits and therefore the bank has 50 billion in equity and that's our starting point now what most people think happens is they think that banks lend out reserves so what i want to show is that whole idea lend out reserve uh, i'll show what banks actually do that's probably the best idea let's say a bank loan what what happens when a bank makes a loan well it's simple they put a deposit amount of money in sorry i'll just start over here they put an amount of money in a deposit account and they say, you know, let's say you, build, you want to build a house. They're saying, here's a million dollars to build a house. So we're going to put a million dollars in your deposit account. And to do that, we record you owe us a debt of a hundred billion, of a, of a billion dollars. That's that's all there is to lending. That's It's so simple. As I, I've forgotten who actually said it, uh, but somebody said, if anybody knew how lending up 
banks actually operate it so simply would discuss the mind but that's the basics of lending then once you've got a debt to a bank you've got to pay interest on it and you pay interest by taking money out of your deposit accounts this is looking at the aggregate level so i'm leaving out principal repayment here for the moment uh, and you pay it to the bank that's the interest of the equity of the bank and then you repay the loan uh, there's a debt repayment over time so there's some repayment going on so you put a minus repay here and that also means the bank then records that they reduce the amount you owe them. That's, that's fundamentally what happens with real banking. Now, what people think happens is they think you have lending out reserves. I'm going to, I'm calling, I'm going to call this uh, minus, uh, I'll call it lend underscore R for reserves. Okay? Now, what's the next operation? How do I actually show to balance this? Because what Minsky is doing is double entry bookkeeping. It's making sure that every row sums to zero. Otherwise, you ain't an accounting error. So if you imagine you lend out reserves, you can imagine the first thing you might think is, well, I'll put that money in the deposit account. Only Minsky says, uh uh, that's wrong because the accounting is false. You can't reduce reserves, which are an asset, and increase deposits, which are a liability. That just doesn't happen. There's something wrong with your accounting. So what you've got to say, well, okay, this is what happens. So you then let reserves go down and loans go up. So you have a drop in one asset of the banking sector and an increase in the other. But the thing is, where's the loan turning up for the actual depositor? The depositor not getting any money out of this. So under what circumstances will the public agree to this form of lending? And you've got to then look at it from the bank, from the public's point of view. So I'll bring in another godly table and I'll call this the public for the you know, non-bank public. And I'll also put it into the same mode so you see the, um, what, it, what happens on the big screen once I, once I start putting the elements together. And now what Minsky has, which is it's the unique, the, the reason we use supplementary bookkeeping so powerfully is I can bring up the public's uh, godly table now and say, well, let's allocate what was a liability for the bank, which is the deposit accounts here. That's an asset for the public. So I choose that and there's deposits. And what's an asset for the banking sector is a liability for the public. So I choose that and that's loans. And Aminsky is matching all these levels here. So I'm going to call this here public for public equity. And I can now show the public actually starts with 50 in equity because they've got deposits of 550 and loans of 500. So they've got 50 positive equity. Interest payments come out of the, uh, their equity. Lending and repayment already covered by the program. What do I do with LendR? Now, the only way to handle it is say, well, maybe you get a loan in cash. And so what happens is, Oh, pardon me, I've got the wrong spot. I put it on the wrong side, so I'll just actually fix that up. Minsky will warn me here I'm turning an asset, a liability into an asset, but that's what I meant. Um, the only way to have this work is that the lending, which, which increases your liability, is we've got that part covered. What they do is the bank gives you cash. So you walk out of the bank with cash. Now, in that situation, we finally have lending from reserves. So the bank gets an asset they can charge interest on. It loses reserves to do it the public gets cash in its hand, but that's the only way that so-called fractional reserve banking works. Now, when's the last time you went into a bank and walked out with a loan in cash? Okay. It doesn't happen. Banks lend by crediting your deposit account and they credit the loan at the same time. So the whole textbook mechanism, uh, which argues that banks create money through fractional reserve lending, uh, you know, take in deposits, lend out a fraction, that gets deposited in another bank, et cetera, et cetera. It only works if all loans are in cash or negotiable instruments and so on. And that is such a trivial part of lending that it's just you can ignore it. So the main situation is banks lend by crediting uh, deposit accounts and that's where your money comes from. So that's looking at it from the point of view of the, um, of the um, public. But what about uh, the government as well? So I've got to look at the central bank I'll call this the Fed, because we all know the Fed. It is the Fed. Imagine I'm doing this for American example. And now we look at the Fed, uh, uh, the godly table. And this is all made self-consistent by Minsky. So I'll bring up its little window here. And then what we know that we have reserves as an asset of the, um, of the um, banking sector, or they're a liability of the Federal Reserve. And so, by the way, is cash. Okay? So I've now got that turning up there. Uh, the, the cash isn't actually physically held at the bank. It's come out to the public. But, okay. Uh, in, 
In fact, yeah, I think that's correct. I think I can get away with that. So I'll call this Fed over here for the equity. What assets does it have? I haven't included it yet. Let's say the, the Fed, the bonds has the Fed has bonds which are owned by it. Let's say they're worth 100. So now I've balanced the system. So how does it, how do we actually get government spending? So I'll now I'm going to be flashing all over the screen here, but let's see if I can handle it. Go back to the bank sector and have government spending. So what the government spending does, it actually gives money to the banks in terms of putting it in the reserves. So the asset that banks government spending is not loans, it's reserves. And then that money gets spent on the public. That's how government spending occurs. And taxation works in the opposite direction. So when I have taxation, what happens is you have minus tax coming out of the deposit accounts, and that also reduces the reserves. So that balances the whole thing. Now, if you come and take a look at it from the point of view of the um, uh, the public, what's going on there, trying to now balance their table to include what happens with government spending, you find that spending increases the equity of the public and taxation reduces it. So in other words, government spending makes the public richer. It's not borrowing money from the public, it's creating money that ends up in the, in the public's uh, bank accounts. So de de deficit spending is not a burden on the public, it's actually a way of financing the public. And this turns up, upside down the attitude you get from mainstream textbooks that the government has to borrow in order to spend. Um, the final thing I'll cover, because I'm now going extremely quickly, let's just go back up to here with the, uh, the Fed once more. Uh, I've got the spending and taxation hitting reserves. Where is it coming from? Well, the Treasury has an account. at the central bank. And I'm going to give this to say, I could leave zero in there. In fact, uh, operationally, that's what tends to happen. But I'll leave it at, say, this 10, just so people don't hassle me about that particular detail. So spending reduces the amount of money in the uh, account and taxation increases it. And if you have a continuous deficit, what this means is this will go into overdraft. Now, that's not allowed by the uh, government systems. So what's uh, the government law, the gov governments have passed laws that don't allow the Treasury to run a deficit, uh, run, to, to run a, a, a negative balance at the central bank. So what they're required to do is sell bonds. So what we now have um, is revenue from bond sales, banks. That's going to increase it, and that actually therefore comes out of the reserve accounts of the private banks at the central bank. And if you now go back to the banking sector's view of things, what's actually going on? Well, they now have... Uh, bonds which are treasury bonds owned by banks so the reserves go down they get an increase in their bonds and what they've done is they've now swapped an asset which with reserves you can't trade reserves and you can't you don't normally an interest on reserves now when the government says here are bonds the deficit that's been run by the government creates additional reserves and if your bonds are equal the issue your bonds equal to the spending you're doing, the reserves that are needed to create the, uh, to, to, to pay for the bonds are paid for, created by the deficit itself. So banks, of course, are going to accept an offer which says you want to swap non-tradable, non-income earning reserves for tradable income earning bonds. They say, yes, please. And therefore, they, they, they transfer it. And finally, you'll find interest on bonds has actually covered that. So we now have, um, this is now an interest payment on bonds, which is made to the to the banking sector. And that's now got to be explained. I'll, I'm going to jump over that because I know I'm spending too much time and I've probably got people's heads spinning as well. But there's also uh, banks selling bonds to the public. And that actually reduces the amount of money in circulation. So I'll quickly show that. If you sell bonds uh, from the banks to the public, um, then that is paid for by the public out of their deposits. And what they get out of, of course, is it, it's, it's mainly there's going to be the financial, the, the non-bank financial sector buying off the banking sector. Uh, that's where the bond, most of the bond trading occurs. But that actually reduces the amount of money in circulation. So that was a, um, you know, hell for leather uh, coverage of how money is created by both the banking sector and the... Um, and the uh, the government, and it's completely different to what neoclassicals teach. 
Can I, uh, Steve, can you bring that up just one more time? I had a, I had a few questions here about some of the notations and how yeah, the sure. session actually worked. Yeah. Yep. And I, I and, uh, oh, hold on a sec. I just have to. Um, so this is more of, uh, I, I'll be exploring the Minsky software myself. And so these, this just actually has to do with just using the software. So uh, yeah. in terms of, you know, there may be somewhat sim uh, silly questions here, but the dash int, the repay, uh, these are all labels and you have the ability to, to label whatever you want, right? Is that yeah, the case? Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. So like, if I, if, 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 I've, I've just used these labels everywhere. Um, but what I want to do is make a copy of them, copy the flow variables and copy the stock variables. And then I can start making a dynamic model of the whole thing. So this, this is, for example, the easiest one to show. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just bring this down here and zoom in on it. Interest payments are obviously interest on the interest rate times the times the loan. So if I say there's a rate of interest on, on loans or that R underscore, I'll call it loans, make it a large, large word. So in rate of interest on loans, uh, then that's now a parameter. I can make it a variable as well, but it's easier to say it's a fixed parameter. So say, say it's 5% with a maximum of 20% and a minimum of 2% with 1% steps involved in changing it. And I then just say, let's type a multiply key. And I now multiply, just drag out an arrow from uh, loans and uh, interest to a multiply key. And now I've got an equation saying interest payments we equal the rate of interest on loans times outstanding loans. And I've told Minsky to recalculate. I get the initial flow is $25 billion per year or whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. But that's that's only the start of building a system of differential equations. So once you've done all the oh. definitions, all these things here, which are undefined, become defined. And then the flow uh, elements down here let you simulate a dynamic model. So that's, what's, that, that's the whole overall purpose of Minsky, to be able to simulate dynamic systems but also because it is just so easy to lay out financial dynamics simply simply seeing what the what the actual um uh flows are is enough to answer most people's questions about money creation and the answer is everything you learn in the textbook is wrong yeah yeah so at this point uh again you have like if you switch to the godly tables at that point does it change anything in terms of those uh uh, uh those formulas uh, no, the formulas or, formulas are independent. So the godly table defines like what the godly tables are doing. Let's go back here and show one in more detail. Let's go and take a look here. So what I've got here is uh, reserves, okay? And you've got an initial a number which is one hundred. Then I've got minus up, lending out. Yeah. Okay. All these terms become elements in a differential equation. So this, the rate of change of reserves is minus lending reserves plus spending minus tax minus bonds to the banks plus interest. And if you look in the equation tab, Minsky is generating that. Share your screen that. again. Can you share your screen Oh, again? pardon me. I'm, I'm talking and thinking I'm sharing my screen. My mistake. Pardon <laughs> me. Thank you. Okay, let's go back and share the screen. So if you take a look at um, at this this column here, here's, look, this is looking at the banking sector's point of view, and this is reserves. So I've got 100, and that's the initial amount of money in the reserve account. I've got minus lender, plus spend, minus tax, minus bond B. I've I actually better minimize this while I do this. Otherwise, we get the cascading screen effect. So what Minsky does is say, well, the rate of change of reserves is minus lend R plus spend minus tax minus bond B plus interest. And if you look on the equations tab, I can't magnify it, but that's the equation there. So oh. Minsky is generating these sets of differential equations for you. And once you've done it using a godly table, you know that the equations are correct because... Well, Steve froze there. Just give it a minute here. It looks Some like, uh, yeah, Minsky. Steve froze. Sorry for the. He'll be back. <laughs> okay. So that was very high speed, but I hope it was okay. Was it reasonable or too fast? Well, I've watched you a number of times do a similar analysis, and it was still pretty fast for me. But uh, <laughs> okay. I, I, it was still well done. Um, I'm trying to understand what this, the dynamics of this system mean. Is this type of financial system compatible with a finite planet? 
you know, no. right now is the stability of this system com tied to growth in both the monetary supply and the economy. We know we need to limit the material and energy it throughput. One mistake, yeah. Yeah. One mistake people make is to believe that the interest, because people, you pay interest on debt, therefore the system has to expand for that reason alone. That's simply wrong in accounting terms because when you look at uh, what interest payments are, that's a flow. If, uh, if you have a, a debt of 100 and your rate of interest is 5%, dollars per year to service the hundred dollars debt and people think well that causes the, the loan itself to grow and that's simply just a mathematical error but the fundamental thing is if you have a, a system based entirely on private profit uh, with no constraints on its behavior then it's going to try to make a profit out of the entire planet and that means it'll be exploiting any free resources it finds and that's what's causing global warming we're using energy which happens to have been you know stored solar energy from a million years ago and we're burning it once, and because you get it for free, and that's the real issue about freedom, uh, you get it for free, then nobody made the resources, you don't pay for them, you don't pay their actual costs. You pay the mining costs, which are not the costs at all of the uh, actual resource. And that's when the, that's the ultimate source of profit. And if you keep on doing it on the planet, you'll wipe the ecosystem out, which is what we're doing. Yeah, so what type of monetary model is compatible with the planetary boundaries and kind of providing a good footing for the social well-being of people while not stripping the yeah. planet of its ecology? We've lost a few words there. I'm afraid it's bad internet at mine. Can you say that again? Yeah, what type of monetary yeah. system is compatible with a... Oh, can people hear me? Yeah. 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 What type yeah. of monetary system is compatible with a finite planet? Or, you know, I the think planetary fundamentally boundaries. you need to depreciate. Well, two, two things. You, 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 first of all, you need to enforce the boundaries independent of the economic system. I, I you know, Will, uh, you know, Wilson was in favor of reserving half the planet for wild species. I think we have to make that decision and say the primary role of humanity uh, is to sustain life on this planet, we regard ourselves as custodians of life on the planet. And that means we have to reserve, and E.O. Wilson's recommendation was half the planet. Hmm. A little frustrating here, so uh, he's, he's um, has a low signal again. Uh, he, Steve, you might jump out, pop in again, I guess, I don't, I'm not sure, but it looks like the signal dropped down. And then um, this one came from a box, um, a question call, and it's it's why does interest not cause infinite growth? Could you elaborate? Is it because of the role of taxes in MMT? So let's see what's going on with Steve. Really back. Well, Greg, you got the spotlight there. Did yeah, you, I don't know why I'm not talking. I, can't I know, I know. <laughs> Did you? Uh, how are you finding the the uh, the presentation so far? I've, I've likewise watched it a, a number of times, and I I get what he's saying. So um, yeah, no, it's it's great. Um, I would like to ask the same questions as to what, what are the alternatives and what practical means there are of, uh, of generating change um, at this sort of level. But, um, yeah, it's a big ask. <laughs> yeah. Um, how about you, Liam? Where's your head at right now? Yeah, I think... Uh, these, these talks always make me realize downloading the Minsky app and working through this particular arrangement is the only way to solidify. For a while there, were you still chalking away? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know where no, I look at The internet failed in my home, but I looked at it, so I lost connection. 
Um, okay, so let's. Um, I think. Uh, I think Liam, you were you were saying something. So you take take it back and just uh, tell me, you know, where where your head's at, and then and Steve will listen. And we got a question up next to uh, about interest, okay, and infinite growth. So let's mm. uh, let's hear from from Liam, and then we'll go on to the question from Abox. Yeah, I was just saying that uh, I've seen this analysis a number of times, and and I buy in that uh, you know our current private debt based monetary system isn't financially sound for the well-being of people or planet. And mm -hmm. I'm interested in the practical alternatives and also the types of power analysis of the landscape of the banking sector and the international politics. You know, where are these inflection points that, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's public opinion or, or particular political agents could actually make a change? Because otherwise, yeah. it really feels like we're quite entrenched. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you simply can't have unconstrained capitalism on a constrained planet. That's 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 the bottom line. And because capitalism is a very intrusive system, if you've got a chance for personal profit, uh, you will take it. And that means we've gone into a, apparently like 97 percent of the planet now has been affected by humans. You only find 3% that is can be recorded as unaffected. And that's because you can find profit there uh, because ultimately, and th this comes back to the analysis I do not on money, but energy. Uh, what GDP fundamentally is, is, is free energy turned into useful work and useful products. And if you, the, because uh, this is where the physiocrats were the only ones to get it right. Because of that so-called free gift of nature, uh, if you can profit from that free gift of nature, you will go and do it. And that's what led to the ecological overshoot we're caught up in now. So the only way is to recognize that capitalism has to be constrained. And I, I like E.O. Wilson's concept, even though I'd go even further, he wanted to reserve half the planet, which would mean we're going from taking 97% of it to 50% of it, reserve half the planet for wildlife. In other words, we'd have no go zones. You just see there are parts of the planet spread across all continents where humans are allowed. If they go there, we, we, we could use, you know, drone technology these days to um, to control their behavior. But the idea is, no, you can't go there. That has to be kept for life uh, outside human the human economy. And if we don't do that, then I think we're going to be destroyed. So that's the idea. Dan just put up the system, half the earth project dot org. And I think that that has to be the overall constraint within within which capitalism operates. Then when you look at our capitalism operates itself, um, one of the reasons that um, we have a, a runaway system, and this, this is the point that um, Frederick Soddy made, uh, everything degrades in the economy except money. So I still haven't thought this through fully because in some ways having a degrading money would actually improve economic activity. Uh, in a crazy sort of way, even though I'm anti-Bitcoin, the fact that the money appreciates stops people wanting to spend it. And you actually get a decline in spending because they're hodls, hold on for dear life. Um, so you need nothing which constrains your spending to the biological capacity of your planet. Uh, and that is a necessity until such time. And this, this is going to sound space cadet stuff, but I think it's ultimately the only way humanity is going to survive is taking production off planet. Once we do that, continue doing that. That's impossible. Uh, even if we imagine taking over all the energy in the galaxy, uh, we, we would only last about 2,000 years before, before we were using all the planet energy. And then we have to go to Andromeda. This simply can't be done. So you have to accept limits, and that's that's the failing of neoclassical economics, completely ignoring the existence of and that the need for limits. Well said. Well said. Uh, Greg, how's uh, did you have any questions uh, at all? I think you were going to uh, say no, something. No, but I'm, I'm I'm pretty much in agreement. Um, but then, and I follow your practical mechanisms of, of uh, policy change that um, may be able to get us there, things like uh, changing classes of shares, 
um, um, things like uh, the um, uh, way that uh, loans for housing is, is dished out mm. as far as um, uh, based on return as opposed to your ability to repay you know what the mm. asset w could possibly return i'm just i'm just wondering what else you've come up with since since um you've taken much more of a um entropy approach to your e economics mm. um whether you, there's more policy changes that you have seen or whether or not the policy changes you're advocating before are, are, are also good question yeah still i mean the, the 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 main contribution there is something that i thought up and then i found somebody else had beat me to it a guy called adam hardy has established a website called carbonrationing.org. I think it's actually renamed it to carbon, carbonwatchdog.org. Uh, but he proposed, and I, I proposed independently, we're now working together, the idea of universal carbon credits. We, with, with the idea we'd have a parallel monetary system. So every every good would have its money price as it does now, now but also the content price, which would be how much carbon was being generated by that product. And you have to pay both prices when you bought anything. And universal carbon credits would be distributed through a central bank, through a central bank digital uh, currencies, on a per capita basis. And you could do it on a daily basis as well. Just you wouldn't need to do it once a year or once a month. You could even faster. So you would uh, initially say, uh, uh, I think interesting for, for, from Christopher Dobby is inflation the thermodynamics of money. I think it's yes, pretty much the answer there. But back to the idea of universal carbon credits, you would get. Um, the allocation, which is, would, could be based initially on the average for the country. So everybody in the country would get the average carbon consumption ration per day. Now, because distribution of income is so massively skewed, 95% of the population would not use the average that has leftovers. And the poorer you were, the more leftover you would have. Whereas the wealthy, certainly 5%, possibly just even 1%, would consume so rapidly, they'd run out of UCC. They had plenty of money, but no universal carbon credits. So they would need to buy universal carbon credits off the poor. On a daily basis, they ought to buy anything, including Avogas for their private jets and so on. So the idea of Little bit of a lag on there. Um well, we've been doing okay with a few few little blips here. So um, let's see if we can fix that. I'll be right back. Hey, Dean. See if you will. Reza, uh, he's he's on freeze right now we've had a, a few issues with his internet so all right okay yeah i just thought it was uh, i thought it was me <laughs> that's all that's, no you uh, got the you got the stage now here oh wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah this the stream is frozen so um yeah just wait for steve to come back in well thank you for jo for joining us reza no it's a pleasure i just got an email that i was uh, finding it hard to get to sleep here in london and um yeah it said come along there's only six people there's a prize to be won and i was like what, what is it it's, a prize it's a live stream with steve keen that's a great <laughs> fantastic well i don't know i don't know about the prize but that's a great idea <laughs> yeah yeah well it's it's pretty good i've really enjoyed uh um what's the word what's the verb patronizing not the patreon or the isaac well, patreon uh, yeah uh steve because you know um I was going to bring up his kind of hissy fit with the Guardian, but I actually quite enjoyed it, you know. <laughs> oh, recently, because, uh, you know. About... Um, why Sorry about you... that. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Are you well? Hi. Good to see you, Reza. Yep. Yeah, I was just saying I really enjoyed your um, unsubscription from the Guardian. I mean, it really is, uh, and, and actually the public way you did it. I know it didn't, maybe not a, it wasn't to everyone's taste, but... Really, some of these uh, some of these outputs give us so little. I've really enjoyed uh, being a Patreon supporter of yours over the years, and Thank actually, you. just the model that you've taken over. I, I really think uh, uh, I, I don't agree with all of your economics, but I, you know, it, it, I love the fact that you put everything out there, especially on private debt and issues like that, and then um, you kind of correct yourself in public, which is quite. Uh, 
is really educational for followers of your, yourself. When when you feel you've got wrong, you're very, you know, you don't have the ego not to correct yourself or whatever. But I really am excited to see what Minsky brings about. And um, thank you. Mm. I know you also have shifted a lot towards uh, climate issues recently. Mm -hmm. um, just the point you made about carbon credits, they've been such a catastrophic failure uh, in the past in terms of, you know, anecdotally and uh, in terms of it, how, how, how could you possibly think or guess that it might work in the future? But I mean, the sound of a central bank issuing, I mean, this is an existential problem. And the, the notion that some big bureaucracy would be able to uh, manage issuing these carbon credits in a non-corruptible fashion it's um uh, it's a difficult one that i, I find that um i look back at the second world war yeah when you face an existential threat that both changes the nature of government actually changes who runs it too remember one of the main people involved in the rationing process in the second world war was john kenneth galbraith you yeah. can get a you know a better critic of capitalism than, than jk um so uh, in that circumstance, uh, you know, Chamberlain gets chucked out of office. You get, uh, not that he's the world's perfect person, obviously, but you get Winston Churchill instead. Um, so when you realise you are facing an existential threat, then you get rid of the idiots like, you know, for example, they're just using somebody at random, Scott Morrison in Australia, totally <laughs> useless turd. Uh, you chuck him out because uh, you know he can't cope. You don't want him... The last thing you want is Scott Morrison running the war effort because he'd be handing over the country to the Japanese on day two. Um, so that's, that sort of person gets kicked out and you get decent people in there. And then you can say your bureaucrats are dedicated to a common objective, which is survival. And um, so that's what I, what I want to do is I want to set up universe, I want to set up central bank digital currencies before it becomes obvious we're having an environmental crisis. Now, by becoming obvious, I mean becoming obvious to everybody not just the people who are activists in the area that it's going to happen and these weather events pro probably are due to climate. Do you, to agree, do you agree with um, uh, Professor Werner's take, the CBDCs? Uh, no, I don't. You, you don't think they will undo banks as they are? Because banks are pretty much in an oligopoly kind of way already. So I know he's he can be a bit weird sometimes, but he does have a point in the sense that... Um, a lot of some of the stuff I've learned from you, is, and I have to say much more than people like yourself and Petful, much more than any economics degree I did. But a lot mm. of that, a lot of the way that money the, the, uh, works, you, you, you know, would it undo some of the things that we're just beginning to, uh, it's actually becoming more and more mainstream, more and more people, you know, beginning to accept that, you know, households aren't, like governments and the credit card things that are very easy for journalists to uh, uh, use as a false analogy, and people are called, beginning to call them, call them out increasingly. And MMT and yeah. is becoming more mainstream. And I was just, I was just wondering, you know, uh, what's your view as how that would uh, affect them? Because yeah. because uh, Vern is very clear. He reckons they'll do away with all banks, and. I've always wanted to sort of reply in my mind, but so what? There's only it's you. you it's a difference between a monopoly and an oligopoly. It's not that big a difference. Yeah, but he's I mean, into all his sparkasa and local yeah. banks and stuff. Yeah, like yeah, a complicated uh, picture position on, on Richard's views. So he's a great fan of the small banks in Germany, and says so right. we need a small com community scale banks that actually know the local businesses and can lend to people who are known to be good business people and entrepreneurs and so on. And I agree with that. I've seen examples of it myself in Germany, quite remarkable. Um, uh, but and he sees the central bank, if the central bank has it, they'll be, you know, they're going to try to take over the, the, the whole financial system. I don't know how many central bankers Richard's met. I've met quite a few. And they, they couldn't organise a conspiracy to make a cup of tea. There's plenty of bright people in the research department. I'm not knocking the research department there. But most of the research department themselves still believe in neoclassical economics. The people at the top of the central bank haven't got an effing clue. Um, so if they try to organise a conspiracy, I'd be quite happy about it because I know the conspiracy would fail. Um, so uh, you, uh, there's a wonderful line in Don't Look Up where Jennifer Lawrence's character is hearing some of her young friends discussing about the comet and saying it's all been invented by the wealthy. And she said, 
the people you're talking about aren't smart enough to be as evil as you're giving them credit for. So that's right. my perspective on that thing. Um, and also, most of the central banks that I have spoken to about this are aware of the dangers of undermining the private banking system by having a deposit account system for the public at the central bank. And that's why a lot of them have stopped looking at it. Like so the Bank of England, for example, stopped looking at it. Uh, they've still got a team that it's sort of a, a, back, a back burner policy. So I would see uh, what, I, what I'm seeing the central bank digital currency as is mainly a conduit to get government money to the public when it's needed in a hurry. So, for example, so I, would, I wouldn't allow deposit accounts, for example. I wouldn't allow you to make a deposit at a central bank. As soon as you say you can't deposit at the central bank, then you can't be a rival for the private system. You can't borrow from them, obviously, either. So it's possible to set it up in such a way that it can't have the conspiratorial out, uh, effects that Richard is worrying about. And as I said, knowing most of the bankers inside, they're, they're, they're afraid of the private banking system. Rather than like being these tyrannical people are going to come in there and take over the private banks, most of them are scared of private banks and actually want to get a job in one and wouldn't want to do much to annoy them. So those are talking there are the mainstream economists. But, but, it, but how is CBDC that, if you understand cryptocurrency, it's not really even that different from what we have now. Is that fair? Yeah, it's not very It's just saying it's a central ledger. I mean, the whole house of cryptocurrencies yeah. is the massive. Uh, uh, decentralization is incredibly expensive in energy terms. And then, yeah. and, 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 and so all that's nonsense. You don't need that. It, 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 cryptocurrencies solve a problem that didn't exist, okay? which is you can't trust bank ledgers 99% of the time you can. I know one or two instances where banks for, uh, uh, fraudulently hid their ledgers from old. This involves an Australian bank losing tapes at one point. So, a full, a, reserve, so okay. a full reserve deposit at the central bank, they're afraid of those risks, but it seems like there's some pretty clear ways to make that less risky. Like you could have a limit on how much money could be put into that account. Yeah. And then you could slowly, you know, reduce the federal insurance of private bank accounts in a way that doesn't cause a run on the banks. It just sounds yeah. like we don't have an ambitious vision and a capable public servant capacity to make these things happen yet. Yeah, and I think that's fair. I mean, I think Richard drastically, again, I think Richard is one of the student, the young people that Jennifer Lawrence was talking to. They're simply not bright enough to be as evil as you give them credit for. So I'm not worried about that. And in fact, they've been too cautious in many ways. I really see those banks as the central bank digital currency as a conduit for government interaction with the public sector, not for a way the government to take over the private banking system. And you don't think uh, Bitcoin has a role to play in terms of the restriction of uh, co the corruptibility of not just no, CBDCs, not really. but the issuance of uh, carbon credits? Because the, the, the history of carbon credits are so, so tainted and there's so many landfills in Africa that, you know, have been just, you know, bought up and people, middlemen trying to... Well, there, there, there's not, this has nothing to do with that. The UCC idea is simply every good, every good has a price content. You're not, you're not trying to use it to do... One. You're talking of carbon offsets. Of course they're corrupted. Uh, I'm talking of... Yeah, it, carbon it, offsets. But I guess the name, it was always called carbon credits, right? Yeah, well, it's called well, universal carbon credits. So right. maybe even need a better, better name. But the idea is... You get allocated these by the government on a on a per capita basis equal to the average for the country per day. Okay, there's not, not, nothing to do with carbon offsets. Right. Okay. Um, it, it'd be interesting to see. Um, I can't wait to uh, get. A, I'll let other people talk, but the Minsky. I can't get a wait to get started on that. I think uh, it requires some time, but I really look forward to it and appreciate your work. I've written a new book about it, which I'm publishing today, I think, or maybe later, uh, on modelling in Minsky. Uh, so it's both a book about it, my approach to economics and also how to use Minsky. It's sort of mixed together. So that'll be there for you. Hello, looks like the bell's being rung. <laughs> okay, Steve. Very good. Um, we're at the, uh, the point in the conversation. Honestly, that was not me that rang that bell. But um, I want to do a little uh, rapid fire of some questions. There's been some people in the YouTube stream here that uh, have asked some so uh, pretty interesting questions. So try and keep them really short. We've got about six to eight of them to run through. Uh, so 
Let's start with Fishing is Fun. He says, uh, Steve did a podcast about predictions for 2020 and 2021. Uh, any predictions for 2022, Steve? Oh, God. I Do mean, you want me to hold your beer? Could... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. Hold, hold my beer. Uh, the, 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 what, I've, what I've now... I mean, people are keeping thinking I'm going to get back to normal, but normal was unsustainable anyway. That's the whole point of being on an unsustainable exponential trend. So my new my my Christmas greeting now is it's not uh, it's not um, Happy New Year it's brace for impact. So every year is going to be tougher than the previous one. We're seeing uh, Omicron right now just causing an absolute explosion in cases. There's some hope that it will be um, part of the disease becoming endemic and less dangerous. But that's still at the moment that's wishful thinking. We won't know for six months whether that's feasible. Um, my main worry is that I think what we're seeing in the climate could be the beginning of the breakdown of the northern hemisphere weather system and I won't make a prediction it's going to happen but I will say that most likely where that damage is going to occur is not going to be in the third world which are all basically around the equator it's going to be the advanced first world which are basically in the temperate zone up towards the pole and that's the area where the weather volatility is hitting and if it really hits then we're going to start, see the start of the breakdown of the, of the Northern Hemisphere food production system. And I don't think it's going to happen this year, but it's, it looks like it's the, 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 pre, the precursors to a, to a breakdown in weather circulation systems are happening. Um, and the more we put carbon into the atmosphere, the more severe that gets to be, which is why I want to have, be able to have a, a rapid reset uh, using something like the universal carbon credits as a way of introducing a rationing system to reduce the load we're putting on the planet. That's not really a prediction. I think, you know, yeah. I think prediction in 2022 is a mugs game. Hey, that's great. Okay, so next one. Uh, if a carbon disincentive incentive system is necessary, how to defeat risk aversion of the public, how to reorientate uh, risky sounding concepts so they sound like ones that are normalized? I think that comes down to actually recognizing the scale of the threat we face. And um, it's... It's still seen, and the economists are responsible for this misframing of the problem. It's still seen by most people as an, as an offset. You know, higher temperature, it's going to cost money to reduce the temperature. So there's a balance between increased temperature and the cost of fighting increased temperature. It, that's not true. It's an existential threat. And it's just in the same way we didn't say, well, what, what's, the, what's the marginal cost of an extra German soldier on, on the English mainland? Or you had you know, Churchill saying, we shall fight them on the beaches, etc., etc. We shall never withdraw. Uh, it, you have to realise there's an existential threat, and then when that is, once that is accepted, then you can do something that is serious about it. The trouble is that means you've got to wait till a serious crisis happens. And I, I simply think the best thing we can do is just politically accept humans are never going to uh, respond to a crisis before it happens. They only respond after. So we need systems in place that, when it happens, we can rapidly change the nature of the economy from one that is pumping carbon out you know, without a thought into one says we've got to drastically reduce our carbon footprint and reduce our energy consumption, but it has to be done in a way that is fair. And if you do it in a way that it puts the costs on the working class, you'll get another gilet jaune and that'll be the end of it. And you'll get a breakdown in Mad Max. That's the, that way lies Mad Max. So I want to do stuff which enables us to hold on to an organized society uh, when we start finding that we're undermining the productive capacity of that organized society hmm. okay uh next one here uh china what do you what are your thoughts uh, a, a sentence or two Ugh. again china in some ways is, is more able to cope with this stuff than the west because two reasons even though it's got a huge footprint it's smaller per capita to begin with and it's because it has a central um uh, 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 people re respect the central authority in china in a way they don't anywhere else in the world, really. Um, so they put up with draconian measures, like the, the people inside the, the, the uh, apartment blocks that had their doors welded shut didn't like it, uh, but they did. They they had they were pretty much forced to accept it. So if you need to force a drastic reduction in carbon consumption and a drastic fall in in, in per capita uh, consumption levels, while making sure that's fairly uh, distributed, so the rich uh, end up having far less. Uh, far far more of a reduction in the consumption of the rich than the poor, and that's seen publicly, and they're shamed if they try to do otherwise. China's got more of a chance to get through it. Right on. Okay. 
Next question is coming up here. Um, I was jumping around a little bit. Um, okay. Talking about the possibility of central planning, uh, Paul Cockshot, are you familiar with uh, Paul's work? Yeah, Paul and I used to discuss on an old degree list called Marxism back in the early internet days in the 90s. And I, you know, I respect his work and I like him as a person. But I think, again, uh, what they're leaving out is the innovative side of capitalism. Um, central planning, yes, okay, you can do it with input-output analysis and so on. Uh, and we'll need to do that, frankly, in the, in the transition stage because you simply have to say we've got to reduce output, reduce our physical footprint and find ways to do it. And central planning will be part of that as it was during the Second World War. Um, but in terms of when you look at the actual nature of capitalism, what you get is innovation and change in the input-output matrix, new products turning up and so on. And that side of things is something that's, that's, that's the positive role for entrepreneurship in capitalism is in that level of innovation. And I don't want to lose that. I mean, as much as capitalism has been incredibly destructive of the environment, it's been incredibly creative in the physical and uh, intellectual uh, processes that humans undertake. And so I want to have that, but, but, but harness it. And it has to be subservient to overall social goals. And the main social goal has to be our role is to preserve life. Because so far as we know, the earth is the answer. And we can't treat life being for the last 200 years. Right, okay, on to the next one here. Um, World War II uh, approaches across the Western powers highly instructive on how monetary system actually works, not to mention the power of government to control the economy and achieve the outcome. Um, mm. Not sure what's. Um, well, that's that's very it's accurate statement. I mean, if you look back and see Beardsley Rummel in 1946 publishing "Taxes for Revenue Are Obsolete," and that was one of the lessons of the Great Depression: taxes didn't actually raise the revenue. What taxes did was reduce the spending power of the public. Uh, the, the the government created the money that financed the Second World War, and they sold bonds to the public not because they needed money from the public, but they wanted to take money out of the hand of the public so they couldn't spend as much on cosmetics and more of it got spent on, on armaments. So World War II taught us a lot that neoclassical economists helped us forget very quickly. And we need to relearn those lessons. And I think my, my model of what we're going to, have to do with climate change is fundamentally reproduce World War II. But now it, the, the battle is against our overreach on the planet, not against uh, Nazis. Right on. Okay. What do you think about the future of carbon capture as a new technology, uh, as the new technology is evolving fast? We started on this a little bit now, a little bit more about carbon catch capture. Is it? Yeah, is I mean, I, the carbon, carbon, I just don't think it's viable. I mean, it, 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 the trouble is we do have an incredible energy constraints. When you look at how much energy we get out of carbon based systems to replace that with renewable is probably an impossible task, uh, not just impossible in terms of how fast we need to do it but impossible in terms of the resources needed. So the work of Simon Meachow, which is an Australian mining engineer now working in Finland for the Geological Survey of Finland, he's calculated, given the actual energy use, not, not just the, like ignoring the fact that half the transportation on the planet is to transport fossil fuels from one point to another, he's taken that into account. And he still reckons you'd need hundreds of thousands of, of, of one, uh, you know, gig, one gigawatt power stations with renewable energy to replace what we currently use in fossil fuels, and it simply can't be done. So we, we have to reduce our footprint. Um, and carbon capture, I think, it, it, it's what I've seen, the energy costs of carbon capture are nowhere near the benefits in terms of reduced carbon footprint, carbon capture. We'd be better off finding ways to replace it. But it, it may be part of the mix um, because we've got to throw everything at this, and you know that includes nuclear, which, I mean, I'm... I'm uh, when I look at the calculations in terms of the amount of energy we need, can we get it out of renewables? The answer seems to be no. So every last non-carbon form of energy has to be considered. Okay. Um, we have we have time for maybe one or two more of these. Um, I was going to step over this one because we had already looked at this of... Uh, smaller banks versus bigger national ones. Hmm. Um, what would Marx want? I, th I thought that was interesting, uh, speculating as to, you know, what if he was around today, what, what his perspective would be, you think? Well, Marx had a pretty good understanding of the, um, of the banking sector. You look in 
I think it's in volume three of Capital, a wonderful thing. Talk about centralization. He said the money lenders and the parasites that surround them uh, get the power to overtake the, uh, the, the physical economy, and this lot know nothing about physical production and should have nothing to do with it. He was very much in favor of small, small financial firms being, uh, being beholden to the industrial sector. So Marx would want much what Richard Werner talks about, small community banks providing uh, capital locally and not the large national centralized systems. And I feel the same way. I think we need non-profit, uh, go back to building societies for homes, credit and cooperatives. Uh, that sort of thing doesn't create money, but it circulates money that's already been created. So I'd like to see a nest of those hanging off government money creation as part of the way of getting money to communities and small scale entrepreneurs. Okay, uh, I'm going to invite everybody back here again, and uh, you know, let's all uh, you know. Thanks, Steve, for coming by, and everybody's welcome to come back again. Please tune in. This was uh, hopefully a successful first launch of our uh, live stream. We're going to have another one next week, um, and I hope everybody that's tuning in on 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 the streams, various different uh, YouTube channels. Uh, as well as all of you guys today, I hope you uh, had a good time and, and, and thanks again, Steve, for, for joining us. Thanks, it was good fun. I'll try okay, to guys. get more reliable internet next time. Okay, right bye. Bye now. Bye all.